Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Let's get started. Today we have a very interesting uh, subject. Okay, my name is Artem Kalashnikov, Nash Finsert. I have a very interesting question to our panelists relating some logic. Look, look, a life story. Some of you asked me a million rubles, rhetorically speaking. You gave me, but you never uh, gave that back. What I lost? What What did I lose? Trust? A million, uh, million rubles? Well, uh, I, uh, I can get it back, G give it back this uh, million uh, rubles. But anyway, I uh, have lost something in this situation. What time? Because uh, during this time, I could have uh, earned uh, more money. So today we will be uh, uh, speaking such a situation. Sem seems like uh, about something which is accessible. Uh, I'm uh, speaking of this value uh, that we uh, have if uh, When we have our life well planned, you know, we just c could manage our life. But now uh, life is ever changing and uh, now time is of uh, another importance, much more importance. And to make a payment, for example, we used to, well, we used to spend a lot of time to make a payment uh, and etc. It, it was a very complicated process. But as of today, If we look at what is going on in, in this financial technologies area, it's very changing, it's, it's rapidly changing. And uh, today any transfer might be, e-transfer might be made just in seconds. And we can uh, transfer money to anyone, <laughs> anytime for financial organizations. They also have their own advantages. In all respects, and it seems like everything is okay. But no, it might it might not be perfect everywhere. So the, there are always some challenges. And if we take P two P transfers. Here we have some things uh, very challenging, convenient, comfortable, but anyway, we have challenges first. For example, if uh, the transfer is, is erroneous, so that the money can be uh, withdrawn any time on the other side. Second. The bank doesn't know well uh, the recipient on the other side and to, to check the legitimacy and all the risks. And the third uh, aspect, uh, requirements, very serious requirements because any operation means security mechanism, right? And if this security mechanism will be slowing down the whole mechanism so the picture is very gloom and in and so we are we will be speaking we will be evolving our uh, session we will be evolving around these three points and allow me to introduce our experts Anna Goldstein master system Dmitry Gardentinkov Artyom Sudarenko, Finserv Bank, and Viktoria Nikitina, Department of Security, Ru Bank of Russia. So, first of all, I'd like to know, well, anyway, everything starts with, well, something, and as the song, a song goes, and I'd like to know, understand how this this mechanism of security started. And I'd like to give the floor to Anna. Microphone, please. Switch on the microphone. Mm 
Well, it's clear that that anyway we do not reinvent the wheel. Um, as of today, there are 30 such systems in the world, instant payment in any in, um, uh, form, and uh, there are 20 in the channel. So we uh, use the best practice, international best practice, and systems that have already been in use, the British system, faster payment system, or Swedish swish, or um, interesting experience, uh, uh, SIEPA in, in, in the EU or other systems. So we, uh, we, we had this uh, best practice at the very beginning. First of all, let's take this. Uh, Scandinavian countries um, also had their own very interesting systems. Does this system use uh, similar tools and mechanisms? Twelve of them are built on technologies 2002, as we are, and Our nine out of 30 as an identificator use uh, the number of uh, the phone. So there are common problems, uh, common risks, common solutions. So this work has been done, done uh, not only within the, the national system of uh, uh, payment cards, uh, but uh, it was headed by Bank of Russia, uh, by uh, uh, operator of the payment clearing services and and the whole team team fintech team uh, association fintech uh, from bank of russia so this is experience that we well studied and and plus international best practice that we used at the very beginning. Well, so we had to take both positive and negative experience, right? So another question arises. Which security problems uh, do we have to address uh, using such uh, services? I'd like to address my uh, second, uh, th this question address it to Artyom. The creation of such services is linked to, uh, with the uh, with typical addressing of typical problems, protection of information, data protection, confidentiality, inaccessibility on all technological uh, areas of uh, the uh, processing of information in payment services. If the credit organization of such a payment service if they uh, face the, uh, the things like c control to the access of the uh, access. <laughs> Scanning and um, the high level of uh, data protection, therefore, the channels, communication channels between participants and they face um, requirements to protect the channel. And so this te technical part of the service in terms of da data protection carries out the same functions as well participants do, but uh, requirements more detailed, more uh, stricter, since typology in the services is a star, well, I would say it's a, just a, of, of paramount importance. So as you see, data protection must be much more effectively organized. We understand that that the principal problems, uh, solving problems relating to data protection are of importance for banks and for, for all interested parties and the use and the development of such services uh, for data protection is not new since 
Well, as uh, Artyom said, service of this instant payments uh, does exist uh, as such. So the data protection is a little bit limited in terms of this uh, uh, constant continuity in a business itself. We have to have a business afloat all, all, all the time, and therefore we should understand how to implement these protection services in technologies. In terms of time, timing, to be more exact, therefore I'd like to also invite Anja Goldstein to answer this, uh, to, uh, this question how on the level of tech technologies they have decided to use uh, this protection mechanisms of uh, uh, super important information. Uh, so you, that's the part that we do defined as the safety of, yeah, 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 right, technological protection. I don't know how to, well, anyway, answer this question. Many copies have been hacked. Um, uh, just a um, year ago, uh, we have been doing our best in terms of technology because this general approach, the less, the fewer, well, we wanted to have fewer risks uh, because uh, the system in this game be, uh, becomes more protected. And uh, this approach of the Bank of Russia to the payment uh, system there should be technological security, anti-fraud security, other types of security, signatures, signatures from messages, a couple of contracts of con control, additional elements of data to check uh, data, and well, uh, and the like. And the like, a lot of measures that we implemented. The m most difficult thing was uh, that we had to do so together with the processing of the whole technology as such. So therefore, we we each day we had to face new challenges and find new d decisions, new solutions. For example, today we're tying anti well, these messages, these things, and uh, at the same time thinking of what risks uh, this will incur, and etc. So a great number of people were involved, and very often we had to get rid of very good decisions. But for some reasons we had to do so and f uh, look for uh, other solutions. Then Artyom, Artyom mentioned um, this re requirements on accessibility. I mean, uh, when later on we had to uh, make up with uh, protection measures to opakatse um, for the safety of uh, transactions. That was not easy because our technological stack is different from typical one because there are requirements on uh, authorization and for this stack it's not so that easy to approach to address many problems because the uh, we still have this uh, accessibility and uh, the like aspects and also we that's why we have been doing our best to find this solution to the uh, signatures for for messages and we uh, we agree agreed upon the free use of cryptator signature or and the problem was that that was the only thing uh, which met the requirements uh, and we were able to scale, but the market, except uh, for uh, the Bank of uh, Russia, which used uh, the, this Yantar uh, con configuration, market did not have the, this um, um, experience to use. Uh, Neither the pilot banks uh, nor the others had any such experience, so we had some uh, issues with uh, uh, comprehending this complexity with uh, um, integrating all these systems and assessing the impact. So we had to uh, find ways to support 
this uh, on the market 24-7 uh, because it's obviously uh, something we need to do. And uh, of course, we didn't need it so while we only used it uh, at the Bank of Russia. But then we needed to do that uh, for all the market participants as well. So it took a lot of work. And it's uh, quite logical that we had some um, uh, difficulties with uh, anti-fraud, with uh, providing a performance of these anti-fraud uh, systems to pick uh, the points uh, for uh, data uh, probing and, and to um, ensure uh, a minimal lag in pr providing a response. So we're using a hybrid method where we use industrial platforms and uh, our own uh, module, an in-house built uh, module. So only that way we were able to do this. Well, as you have probably realized, this is an, um, a tiered service. There are many links in a chain which uh, uh, all matter to um, make uh, the system secure. So the technological function we would like to discuss now also needs to be represented at every stage, on every link, and at every tier. So I would I give the floor to Artyom to tell us about this technological function as a vivid example uh, of uh, security being built into or integrated into the technology itself uh, completely. I don't think we should speak about a technology as itself, but um, I think it's more about uh, the data that are being transferred uh, within the uh, transfer um, service. We need to ask ourselves whether we are certain that uh, the payment uh, data has been generated by a user who have the right to um, dispose of their uh, money. And here where the tiered approach to security comes into play and uh, why it's uh, um, more important than technical security. Um, and here, where the uh, anti-fraud uh, discussion um, is relevant again. So whether it's uh, a rapid payment service uh, of the Bank of Russia or whether it's a card payment service, an anti-fraud system is, first of all, assessed by the credit institution, by a, a bank, uh, which uses the know your client principle uh, on a consistent basis and uh, given the data that they have can tell whether the payment is valid from their banking point of view and the second tier in this regard um, would be the operational payment and clearing center uh, which solves another task of, even though it's part of uh, the global task of determining um, uh, the validity of the payment. And this task is solved using a big amount of data which are not bound to a specific client. Um, these are data obtained by the uh, Payment and Clearing Center uh, from a big numbers of payments which go through it. Um, and uh, we can see that we have not yet answered the original que question. What was so big and difficult about the challenges that we faced? And I, as a representative of the Bank of Russia, um, I think I uh, have not yet received, a, um, had, has not yet presented a um, full answer to that. So I think we will discuss this um, now. And I think that uh, an important introduction to that would be that we need to um, you, um, to harmonize the data that are coming from uh, various players in the market. Because we have uh, big banks, which have a big experience in introducing anti-fraud systems. And we have smaller institutions, which don't have such capabilities. And we solve this. Um, by establishing a number of uh, regulations, uh, stipulating common approaches and rules, 
uh, define how uh, technical and technological um, means of establishing security and preventing fraud should be used. Thank you, Artyom. Well, it's evident that uh, regardless of how many uh, links there are in your technological chain, uh, you need some clarity and transparency. And uh, while we're speaking about regulations and uh, setting up processes, I would like Victoria to tell us about uh, her impression of uh, the work that has been done, how much has actually been done, and uh, what do we need in terms of uh, regulating this kind of process? Uh, thank you. Um, I support the things that have been said, and we're trying to move uh, together with the regulatory framework. But you need to know that this all started when the uh, Federal Law 167, um, amending Law uh, 161, was uh, adopted um, relating to um, money transfers and aiming at preventing uh, unauthorized transfers and a uh, number of uh, information security requirements for such uh, transfers. And the Bank of Russia has developed uh, instructions uh, 4726 uh, uh, to further develop Law 161. And uh, as regards the uh, rapid payment service, we've amended uh, some uh, payment system rules. It's uh, Regulations 595P on a Bank of Russia's payment system, uh, 672P. Uh, this is the main document we should be speaking about today. It uh, relates to uh, protecting information in the Bank of Russia's information systems. And uh, uh, these have uh, been uh, developed, produced, and implemented. And the main requirements of uh, Regulation 672 are aimed to protect uh, data infrastructure according to uh, the GOST standards. Uh, as Anna said, uh, the current regulation s says that uh, the uh, operational clearing and payment service needs to ensure a, um, an elevated level of security and uh, other market participants can have a standard level of security. And there's also a number of requirements uh, providing for the service as a, um, as security, a number of um, data exchange requirements, uh, some standards uh, on electronic signatures, on uh, registering, um, on registering participants. Because uh, each participant can be registered um, at, in their own um, segment of the system. This can lead to incidents if not addressed properly. There are also requirements on anti-fraud procedures, on uh, information exchange, on incidents uh, that may arise. And this service is now uh, being actively developed. And uh, this regulation will be updated as we go. Um, regulation 672 also uh, speaks about uh, a number of anti-fraud procedures implementing law 167 on suspending information exchange and suspending operations. Uh, there had been a long discussion on how to um, legislate this, but now we have a number of working approaches. This is being improved further. Now, as regards um, exchange, exchanging information uh, about the incidents, uh, the regulations that we currently have already um, um, enable us to know about uh, the incidents uh, that arise, about uh, the, uh, the, all the particulars of the pair, and we know that uh, the customer's client ID is the number that is used in the, these situations. 
and uh, both this ID and all the related data are sent to the Bank of Russia in case of any, uh, uh, any incidents. And the timelines um, for uh, system participants to uh, report incidents are regulated by a standard that we have, and you probably um, know it is uh, already know it. And we'll also have a document um, that sets out uh, the procedure for implementing anti-fraud um, rules in their organization. And that's uh, probably the most uh, relevant uh, issue that we have. And uh, I'll repeat that um, our main focus today is to reduce uh, risk inherent in such operations. And so I would like to reiterate that we have a number of uh, legislative initiatives. Um, for example, we have an, um, a draft law on establishing a, a single information space with corresponding changes uh, to law 167. Uh, it aims to reduce uh, the incidence of fraud And as the main identifier in pre-service and in rapid payments is the telephone number, uh, the bank will uh, send this telephone number uh, to uh, the network carrier and the mobile carrier will return um, a confirmation that this number indeed um, belongs to the person in question. And we're also preparing a second uh, set of amendments and uh, documents uh, to provide additional security and uh, methodological guidelines that will help in implementing uh, security systems in uh, payment um, operations. Yes, uh, you've given a quite a, an impressive overview um, this is an impressive volume of work that you've been doing. I think a regulator uh, can afford some initiative in terms of uh, introducing uh, new rules. But uh, we also have um, also have the implementing parties, and so we need to maintain some balance uh, between. Uh, the efficiency of requirements in theory and in practice. And Mitri is a representative of an organization that uh, uh, implements these rules in practice. So uh, please give us some insight on how effective, how feasible these requirements are. And you, I suppose you can be frank with us. Uh, so please let it be a revelation. Well, I don't think there'll be any uh, revelation uh, for anyone here, um, over the time that I've worked in uh, cybersecurity, the requirements um, have are steadily being implemented um, better and better, and they usually proceed from actual realities. And uh, the central bank's um, initiatives are usually uh, aim to optimize existing operations. And uh, up to 80% of these requirements are already implemented at the time where the central bank issues some instructions because they address real risks. And of course, it's something we do um, day to day. Um, and one of the uh, one of the um, newer initiatives and initiatives that cover new ground is uh, something relating to anti-fraud. Um, we now uh, pass information to uh, FinServe, and, and it's uh, much uh, easier to uh, pass it through one um, uh, one machine uh, through the IP system. Um, so it's good to have a one-stop shop, and uh, actually we would have as many stops as we would um, as it needs to be. But it's good to have that automated. And the Bank of Russia has also issued uh, some uh, other useful regulations. 
and it's good to see that the bank sees uh, the risks and um, <coughs> aims to have a better communication. Um, and if we have uh, instructions from the Bank of Russia, and then it's easier for us to convince our security um, services or other institutions that uh, this is something that needs to be done and that this, these risks are real. So I don't think we can complain. I just uh, think that we try to be uh, quicker to adapt and uh, to move quicker than, uh, the, re than the regulator. Uh, we're now trying to apply the GOST um, to the, the, the framework of uh, 382P, and we're looking at the processes and requirements that are covered by these <coughs> regulations and are looking to remove overlapping areas and duplications. Thank you. Okay, um, me as It's clear that um, uh, well, we we'll have some well problems. But anyway, uh, I'd like to have a comment uh, on the part of uh, a regulator and um, <laughs> represented here by Artyom. I un understand that any technology well has an explanation which will explain how it is so right now. Okay, let's first give the floor to Anna. So you you, you don't want to no no no. Uh, then, uh, then I can add uh, something after Anna. That will be easier. Thank you for giving me the floor. Let me explain why it happened that in one uh, single case, um, reporting uh, uh, against the normative docs, we should uh, we had to do two places. Uh, there is two rules. Uh, which uh, requires report incidents, uh, infrastructure incidents, and those related to transfers without the consent of the client, and, uh, notwithstanding the, the channel's use. And uh, there are operational documents of SPK, uh, SPK uh, saying that, well, uh, attempt of fraud in um, uh, instant uh, service payment should, should be sent to the portal of the participant. But this is a, uh, the things uh, of the past uh, and uh, when we did, didn't have clear instructions on reporting. And um, we did everything uh, in line with an analogy well, and uh, they were only uh, processing and clearing center only for the MIR program. Well, and when uh, frauds are reported uh, today, just uh, an, uh, another matter. Speaking uh, of instant uh, payment service, the, uh, this requirement uh, is, is now well be, uh, lifted. Anyway, I'd like to say that participants are different. Dima is com complaining that, OK, anyway, he has everything good, and he's automatically reported to his own fitness, financial center. But there are other. Other examples when uh, it's really difficult to report uh, fraud uh, because the uh, this uh, the process is not that speedy. Therefore, there are some situations when, for example, identificators, uh, which can help you to use the anti-fraud systems, there are, are they just simply don't exist. And uh, there is no uh, an identificator. Therefore, it's very difficult to search for these operations and use them in uh, training models. So we're getting rid of this requirement. And I hope that uh, in near future, we this operational bulletin will be uh, uh, in effect. Well, now it's my turn to uh, comment. When, when the instruction uh, 4926 uh, was developed, uh, it had this 
prevention that fraud can be reported, uh, a fraud which uh, which might appear in the system of instant payment. It's, there was a requirement. But when we switch to its practical implementation of, of this document, the instant system of instant payments, it was practically at a rudimentary level. And <coughs> And we uh, we were engaged with uh, we were, well we were working with frauds, frauds payment cards frauds, and uh, um, yes, and uh, settlement account frauds. So and uh, that was the time when we started thinking of and we uh, came to took to conclusions that uh, on a voice to the, this uh, thing of the past that really exist uh, exists uh, within the operational uh, system we should get rid of them uh, of it and uh, and we want the participants who well the players who just didn't pay attention to requirement on the platform, we didn't want them to lose the, a fraud, we wanted it to be reported in SPK. We should understand that the system, a reporting system that we are developing, it's a new service and it uh, tends to have uh, some weak points, but anyway, there is a lot uh, that should, should be done, I mean, in terms of service of reporting, and uh, soon we will we'll have a new release of uh, the software which will allow us to be flexible in inform informing a pool of data uh, which we need for reporting and also what is planned, uh, the change in uh, norm norms and regulations to make reporting more transparent. As for the well, development in, in terms of uh, reporting, uh, and I'd like to switch to a little bit to automation services. Uh, we have, uh, uh, well, um, internal affairs ministry sometimes uh, to turn to us for the operations on non-sanctioned, unauthorized, uh, and in the um, uh, investigations, uh, they really face this uh, problem, which takes a, a lot of time to find out who did so, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because uh, all this work is made manually, so therefore it's done man manually. Why not to f use for the map? With uh, in our country, uh, cooperation with the uh, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs, well, not only market, uh, but also fed federal uh, services are concerned about this because they uh, spend a lot of time on, on the for the on the, on the notifications, on sending uh, queries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and for processing all this. So, but we have to understand that there are certain requirements, legal requirements, which should which should be in line with our possibilities in, uh, related to automatic transfer of this data. So, therefore, at first we have to think about this legal uh, environment first. And technically speaking, then we will try to get in line with that. I'd like to make a, um, a conclusion. Well, of course, the first step is always difficult, especially when we are building such a global service <coughs> which has a lot of chains. It's very complex. We. Together, we we had so many problems, and we made the same mistakes. We just couldn't avoid this. And here we have to uh, realize that one technology and one technology which is our competency, uh, uh, we can build it. But there are related technologies, institutions, which which cannot change as such. 
sometimes uh, it uh, comes down to legal fra framework, so it requires time. It's step by step process. We also concerned. We're also concerned with this uh, uh, matter, and we have some ideas about this. We all, we all are working. All parties are working on this problem. Getting back to my first words from uh, the well, resume, that the first step is always difficult. <clears throat> there is a question on how to choose how to choose an architecture on which this technology will be working, will be effective, will be efficient. Anyway, in the architecture has been selected and how it happened, Anna. Could you refresh my memory? How we, how have we chosen this architecture? You mean architecture of what? Of what? Of all technological chain. Once again, make me happy. Well, based on best practice, well, a good team, team of experts selected the technology uh, 2002, standardized, and then with the use of technologies that we have, we address this uh, problem of anti-fraud problem. Let me, well, get back. Well, what we started with, uh, the main risks related to the P2B, uh, P2B transfers in any, by the way, system of uh, uh, interbank uh, transfers, the main risk, the principal risk, is that uh, payer bank, pay, payment doesn't have, sometimes doesn't have uh, all the information he and uh, practically knows nothing about the other side. And this, well, it's it's a common problem, common risk for in, uh, interbank uh, transfers. And this can be addressed by, well, uniting anti-fraud information of both parties. And this data, uh, uh, this exchange of in, in information should be present. Well, please raise your hands. Those who know know the standards of the protocol of the main function of processing and clearing center. Well, I see that there are such people in this very room. <clears throat> In the first version of this uh, this um, protocol, there was a uh, possibility for processing clearing center to give uh, the, the risks to the payment bank uh, so that it can uh, study it in, in its or in its fraud reporting system against the criteria and requirements in existence. Now, this technology uh, also has, has some add-ons which uh, allows to evaluate risks even better. And uh, it, this will be implemented into the re release uh, one, two, one two oh and one nine, and this is this is the information that you can find on the uh, portal. Uh, also, uh, there are some um, response codes that has been that have been added in order to show that the operation is not transparent. As for process clearing center, it doesn't uh, has this uh, um, target to protect one particular uh, uh, client. No, we're speaking about the large scale. Uh, 
uh, war on fraud. And bank is protecting its clients in order and in order for bank to do so effectively, we are adding this uh, exchange of uh, evalu risk evaluation. And uh, as for uh, the role of a processing and clearing center, counter it is counter counteracting of money flight, mass money flight, in order to protect uh, credit. Organizations. And second is protecting customers' data because it's something we often see today where attacks are carried out to obtain information about uh, customers' accounts and uh, you know how this is done. Um, banks have uh, their um, systems where um, the number, uh, the telephone number serves as uh, the um, customer's ID. And if you only know um, what a person's telephone number is, apparently you um, don't have um, enough information. And this has been exploited uh, by fraudsters um, many times. and. It's something that's uh, being done in uh, interbank um, transfers. There's a two-tier system of defense aiming to protect banks from this um, in the instant payment system. So the current layout is uh, banks uh, continue to um, try and ident identify uh, cases where um, information uh, about uh, customers' accounts is being exploited and uh, collected uh, illegally. And Tinkoff has that, uh, we know, and uh, other banks as well. And uh, the uh, Payment and Clearing Center is uh, the second tier, it also tries to identify uh, scans, that is, operations which aim to um, fish for information about uh, customers' accounts and banks. And so we block um, the operation if we identify it as a scanning attempt, and we also uh, suspend the customer's operations um, for a um, statutory period. And this system has uh, been very successful. Uh, we only have uh, isolated cases um, going through to our level. Um, these cases are when uh, the attempt passed these uh, defense um, levels. And of course, uh, these cases exist because uh, criminal activity still abounds in our sector. And I think Dmitry can tell you more about how it's done. Yeah, since this is a, a tiered system, we need to realize uh, which measures are implemented on what uh, tier. Uh, we've heard about uh, the middle section, but uh, now I'd like to hear what happens uh, in the beginning. Mitri, what processes do you have? Well, we've had a, a, the telephone number ID system. Um, the longest, I think, uh, along with, uh, together with Sberbank, we started simultaneously. So, of course, uh, there are some attempts to uh, exploit this, and currently it's uh, it's addressed by making limits, imposing limits on a source of payment, and it's used both by the bank on the fraudsters' side and. Uh, by uh, banks whose clients may be targeted. So the limits are a pretty uh, efficient way of addressing this sort of vulnerability. Uh, the next uh, method is, uh, well, if you have 10 operations per minute, um, they may um, 
if you, if we have progressive limits if you have um, used all your operations like 10 minutes uh, within uh, 10 operations within a minute or something we have uh, limits like 10 operations uh, an hour and this increased limit uh, is imposed until um, this is investigated or the suspicious activity subsides and depending on the level and uh, so limits are a good way to fight that um, as a basic method and I think that to, uh, in time we'll see uh, better ways of using this method in the future where we have behavioral analysis um, implemented well thank you um, so we have someone um, trying to find um, identification numbers to get uh, account information. But do you have limits on a number of attempts or on the number of operations? It's a limit which sets the maximum number of attempts to input a telephone number. Uh, first, we can have, we have the limit where we uh, don't allow you to get the inf account information unless you carried out an, an operation. And the second, where we set limits against other banks, we don't provide uh, just we don't just provide a outgo uh, outgoing a telephone number, but we have a, a unique identifier which is unique for the um, payer, and we have, can set a simple limit that will. Um, prevent 99% of uh, all fraud attempts. Well, OK. Uh, if this was implemented at every uh, bank, uh, then, th th then this would not be a problem altogether. I think uh, the fraud methods would, um, would change. You remember when we had uh, a login and password system, then we had keys, and now it's all different, and the methods change. Okay, and what would be the next step for fraudsters? I think a slow, slow attempts would be um, a slower pacing of attempts would be a method. Yes, and we're already uh, defending against that we uh, try to analyze which uh, percentage of operations end in a transfer. Um, so we're prepared for that. Yes, and then uh, they would have um, artificial intelligence uh, to have intelligent analysis. If you have a, if you have a, a list of uh, normal operations, uh, a list of legitimate operations carried out by a customer, you can analyze them and uh, pick out behavioral patterns that can be indicative of a fraud attempt because no um, regular person would try to pay a ruble 1,000 times. Yes, I think that's been recognized as a fraud indicator since 2003, like uh, many small payments. Yes, uh, I think uh, it was also used by operationists uh, to uh, accumulate wealth by uh, one copic yes there's a there's a movie called the theory of numbers uh, it has it is describing a, a similar method well um, I also have a theoretical question it's uh, theoretical because we don't have uh, the groundwork that's needed for for that I uh, suppose that we have um, a requirement for banks and uh, mobile carriers to identify their customers um, in mutual interaction so that banks can know who the person is and the mobile carrier knows um, who the person is. So how will it um, change the game for um, the fraudsters, uh, for the fast uh, account scanning and slow scanning. Uh, this could be a concern. Oh, like, imagine it's a concern for me personally. 
Um, what, what could you say? So I, I, I just want to hear your personal opinion. Oh, so it's me again. Oh, well, as far as I understand, um, this law aims to solve this on a broader basis. Um, the banks have long had their integration um, uh, arrangements with the big four of operators, at least, so that their anti-fraud uh, systems have uh, information to help decision-making. Because one of the attack vectors is to intercept a number, like uh, uh, counterfeit, using a counterfeit uh, a SIM card or something like that. So the anti-fraud system um, obtains the information about so the, the mobile customer's behavior, like they, whether they have changed their SIM card or changed an operator. And every operator has their own uh, system uh, to record these actions and these events. So we need to integrate with each operator separately. And not uh, every operator actually offers such collaboration because uh, you have more than the big four in the regions. There are many smaller companies. And this law aims to uh, make it a mandatory requirement uh, to provide this information and uh, a possibility for banks to request this information. And uh, which is uh, most important, uh, it provides for one a central um, one central point of access to all of this information. And of course, this will take time to implement this. And uh, as I understand, uh, the uh, central operator has not been selected yet. But ultimately, this will help us and to solve the problem uh, for smaller banks and uh, for the banks that operate uh, outside Moscow. Um, where there are many regional mobile operators. So, of course, this will not be the end of fraud, and they will come up with new methods. But the problem is that this method is too easy, and uh, we need to, um, to do something to remove it, because it is too, too easy a method if you just need the telephone number of a person. Uh, you you have uh, the telephone number as a means of confirmation at uh, all the uh, uh, at various payment and uh, authorization systems so it's a, a very uh, dangerous thing okay uh, Dmitry, um do you think this can uh, influence uh, the know your customer procedures does this have any impact on this sort of um, due diligence? Uh, when uh, the recipient is uh, selected, um, can we initiate some sort of a know your customer procedure to know more about who's requesting it? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure you need this actually, because it's uh, one of the risks. Well, I think it's uh, more about uh, law one, one hundred fifteen. I think it's covered by that as well, yes. But we also have uh, many other problems um, related to mobile carriers, such as uh, switching to um, IP telephony services in Nicaragua, for example. And uh, this is a very popular method where you get a call from your bank or you have a call uh, from a customer if you're a bank and uh, they just switch to uh, to a roaming um, kind of access and they obtain all the communications intended for that party. So knowing your customer here will probably prevent uh, mass withdrawal of uh, money to various um, unknown numbers. Like you can uh, have uh, some minimum, uh, maximum allowed sums um, withdrawn to uh, fake numbers uh, registered somewhere um, in a distant region. 
So that would be a solution in that regard. I think that this can be useful. <coughs> Um, but in order to solve the issues under law, 115 is uh, something like that. But uh, the overall security approach m must include a broader set of measures and, and working with the mobile carriers and other things. So um, what would you uh, suggest uh, in terms of uh, other measures? <coughs> what should be done in the near future to ensure better security? Um, as relating to the three challenges that we uh, outlined at the beginning, what could we do and what could you do? Uh, a very simple example, just to, to through a one central, well, let's say, point, without uh, referring to uh, communic uh, communication operator and to link as a locator of a telephone to a con create organization or, or have the transfer of this number of phone number, that would be great. And uh, we don't want to a uh, phone number with 495 code, uh, Ross Telecom operator, MTS, or whatever, when they get this uh, from Nicaragua and uh, think that it's a normal. Uh, well, yes, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very known example. It's very good to have some. Let's have to well the so-called one window and to understand that this particular phone number is related to one particular organization and why not to introduce uh, the measure of responsibility for ignoring uh, such requirements and consequences that uh, might arise. Okay, yes, quite a logical uh, train of thought. Okay, Anna, what you uh, could do to improve the security level? From you, it's a more difficult question because you're ch a middle chain. Relating to this, I mean, the subject that we are discussing as a middle uh, link in this chain, from your part, what do you think should be done for improvement? Well, as we're speaking of uh, this uh, exchange of risk evaluations, we need uh, common rules. Uh, otherwise, we will have a very unclear situation, senseless. Exact but useless. You know, the rules should be clear cut. That should be informative. So, I mean, we need a possibility to uh, uh, give this um, a risk evaluation uh, information from you know, from one organization to another. I mean, for the other party to take this information into account and have this history, to keep this history of uh, all the operations uh, done, it's not that easy, this uh, operation. I think that uh, Apple Pay has that uh, sort of thing. No, 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 no. You know, uh, criteria are different there, and criteria for the banks to take into well account. But the principle, uh, but the uh, formula is the same. Apple Pay uh, sends scoring by itself, but the scoring by international systems. <clears throat> is made the same way, is done the same way. But the thing is that it's a risk, a risk evaluated by a payment system, but we are speaking of exchange, exchange among all players. 
when any two participants might become a couple uh, as a pair and well the part that pays and the part that gets the payment if they understand uh, risks in different ways so there is no this this dialogue is senseless that's what i'm speaking about to transfer their exchange to be more exact of um, all the risks and evaluation of the risks. For example, Bank of Russia has this task which is high on its agenda. And there should be a consensus, consensus for all parties. But anyway, the, the suggestion should be made by the Bank of Russia. Well, I think it will be so, and it's clear that uh, any uh, action in this area, since all links are uh, on the in, on this battlefield, well, to have to to be efficient. Well. Uh, we understand that each uh, to scrutinize each link is difficult, uh, and it's really difficult to be very detailed because we try to give this general de description of the process, its links, links of this chain of process. Try to show the uh, importance of each link in this chain, because each link contributes to the chain. And of course, to be more exact, to be more detailed, we need more time. When there is no clear understanding and then uh, of the importance of the whole process, we face a lot of difficulties, difficulties in order to catch up with the time that we really don't have, because the world is evolving was it at a crazy speed, and therefore we should be in line with this speed, and no, but, but I, perfectly, ideally speaking, we should be one step ahead. Well, before you forget, uh, I'd like you to look at what we have d discussed, not as the participants, but also as the users of the services. Look at this from a user standpoint. And I think here it will be clear for you what should be done, how it should, should it be done, and uh, question will arise then for the regulator to really make this environment more safer. So we still have two, three minutes. I, I, if I, well, there is one question, one question from the audience. Please feel free. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues, for a very interesting discussion. I have two questions, but anyway, I'll ask one to the representative of Bank of Russia. You mean whom? To whom? To Artyom. Maybe Anna will also to Anna and well P2P P2P transport means P2P um, interaction between uh, banks and plus controller and Bank of Russia uh, Russia as regulator. This interaction is based on the agreements. There is a concept that this interaction violates the existing uh, federal law. Because there should be written consent, consent from each player involved. Client's phone also, and all the details of his account, etc., etc., etc. Could, could you comment this, taking into account that uh, Roskomnadzor uh, wants everything to be cleared up on paper? And also the number of the phone is equal to personal information. But what if uh, if we failed to do so? We well, well anyway we are speaking of a perfect situation. 
So, what can be said? Maybe yes, maybe not. Question is uh, not clear. There were some initiatives aimed at giving data to regulators. There are some norms allowing to ask for this um, information. Now, we, I don't think that uh, uh, there's anybody who is ready to give you a clear answer. Anyway, there is such a problem, and we will be speaking uh, of this. We will be th thinking of this, and uh, as soon as such uh, things are addressed, are clear-cut, we will get back to uh, dialogue again. And I'd like to comment, uh, you know, according to a payment system rules for the client to participate in a service of instant payments. Bank uh, gives the consent on the consent of the client to participate in um, instant payment service. There are requirements, common requirements and rules for a client to participate in such a service according to the payment service. Uh, all the parties should provide for uh, consent of all parties preliminarily. Microphone, please. No, it's not a technical question. Again, we're getting back to common rules. It's clear and we will be uh, we'll get to that. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks again. Uh, and um, also allow me to tell you, please keep your money in a safe place. Thank you. Bye.